Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, Tulsa's source for great gardens, southwoodgardencenter.com and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Welcome to a brand new year of Oklahoma gardening. On today's show, host Casey Hinches builds a cold frame out of hay bales and repurposed windows. We travel to Edmond, Oklahoma to stroll through the Margaret Annis Boys Arboretum. There are helpful tips for growing onions, and gardener guide Paul James joins Casey to check out some great specimen plants for the landscape. like the moment after the holidays are over and that first seed catalog arrives in your mailbox, we all get a little antsy to get out into the garden. And we are excited to be back with fresh new shows. And we're gonna start off our show today by doing a project combined with planting some seeds out in the garden. Now, right now, this time of year, we have some really nice days followed by some really cold days. And so we're gonna build a straw bell cold frame to help moderate those temperatures. You can see what our straw bell cold frame is gonna look like. We've gotta do a little bit of work here. So we're gonna go ahead and tear this apart and prep our soil before we finish our cold frame. So we've got our bed prepped and we're ready to start planting our seeds. In this cold frame, we're gonna plant some carrot seeds and some sugar snap peas. Um, we wanna put our peas on the north side because they're gonna get a little bit taller than our carrots. The carrots that we have that we're gonna plant are called a cosmic purple. We're gonna plant those on about a four inch spacing. So we're gonna kind of make a line here. We're gonna do two rows down the middle of our irrigation and then one row on the outside of our irrigation. So carrot seeds are really quite small. So what we'll do is just kind of sprinkle those down the rows. Now before we do that, it's important to have good moisture around your seed. So what I like to do is get a little uh, potting soil and kind of sprinkle that down our rows here. We don't need a lot, but what this will do is just give us a little bit more um, moisture retention around our seeds. We're just going to kind of tap our seeds as we go down following our potting soil. You can see how tiny these seeds are. Now of course when these start to germinate, we will need to thin them out so that they don't have as much competition between each seed, each plant as it grows. Now we wanted to use a little more potting soil just to cover those seeds. And traditionally what we think of as a rule for planting depth is two and a half times the diameter of the seed. So considering how small carrot seeds are, we really are not gonna cover them over that much at all. So this again will just help keep some of that moisture around those seeds um, once we water them in. And then we just kind of want to smooth them out as well, making sure that we have good seed to soil contact so that we don't have too much air exposure on those young seedlings as they germinate. You might have noticed our little bit of tin foil on our drip irrigation, and this is just kind of a, a thing that we have figured out. Around our joints, these hard pieces of plastic, we have found that they tend to leak, and it looks like we've got some sort of rodent, whether it's a mouse or a squirrel, uh, that likes to come in here and kind of chew on just these hard joint pieces. So we've done a lot of different things and we've actually found that tinfoil works the best. So that's why we've got some tinfoil wrapped around some of our drip irrigation. Down at this end, we're gonna plant some sugar and snap peas and we're gonna put those on about the same spacing. Now these peas, 
are more of a bushy pea, so they're only going to get a couple of feet tall. Um, and they don't really need trellising like some of your taller uh, snap peas that we're going to plant in our keyhole a little bit later. These you can trellis if you want to. We don't plan on trellising ours. Really the value of trellising these is just to help with harvesting a little bit better. Um, but they are fine growing on their own. You can see that pea seeds obviously are a little bit larger. So we're going to plant these individually down our line here. We always want to make sure that we label our seeds. Um, so we've got sugar and uh, peas. And then also put the date of when we planted these so that we can kind of see when we're out there whether they should be coming up or not. So we've got our peas on the north side here. And we've got our carrots on the south side. Now one of the other things I wanted to let you know is the reason why we planted our carrots in our traditional vegetable bed is because this soil has really been cultivated and it's a nice loamy soil. Carrots are a taproot and so of course they want to grow straight down. If you have clay soils or rocky soils, you might find that your carrots tend to fork a little bit or split. Um, and in that case, you would want to use a raised bed or even a container garden to grow your carrots. If you just really want to grow your carrots in your rocky soil, look for a carrot cultivar that's a little bit shorter. Of course, it'll be shorter so it won't be growing too much into that soil. Now we just need to water these seeds. So now that we have our bed prep, all we're going to do is roll our straw bells back into place and then put our window frames over our bed. So basically what we've constructed here is an insulated greenhouse giving our temperatures a little more consistency for our plants. Um, now as the temperatures start warming up and we start having more warm days than we do cooler days, we're going to need to vent these. Um, this is why we used windows. You could use doors, but what I liked about windows in particular, if you put the inside of the window facing up, when we have those hot days, you can just open the window. If you have a door or a shower door that you want to use, you're going to have to prop that up somehow. And with our Oklahoma winds, that can be a little risky if it gets caught by the wind and blows off. We are going to put some wooden stakes just to kind of secure this in place. Um, now because we've planted peas and carrots, the screen actually will serve as a nice way to keep those insects out. But uh, peas and carrots don't need pollinators. They don't need insects to pollinate them. Uh, peas are self-pollinating and of course carrots were after the root so it doesn't matter. If you were to plant something in here that needed insect pollinators uh, to get that fruit then of course you would want to take those screens off. As our peas continue to grow they might grow a little bit too close to these but by that time our temperatures will be warm and we'll go ahead and remove these frames. These frames we got for about $10 at our local rehab store and it's a cheap and easy way to go ahead and get those seeds started in the garden a little bit sooner. So often when we're looking at adding trees into our landscape, we're curious about what those trees are going to look like when they're mature. We're here at the Margaret Annis Boys Centennial Arboretum, which is at the Bickham Rudkin Park in Edmond. And Brian Dorder, you're joining us again with Oklahoma City Community Foundation Thank because y'all helped make this happen. Well, you know, these are opportunities that you just don't run into all the time. Here was a city that had a piece of property they were going to develop out as a park. Here was Miss Boyce, who Margaret Ann's Boyce had left her estate to the Community Foundation for Beautification of Public Space. 
and we had that chance to turn around and really work with the urban foresters, with the parks department and all, and start putting this together. And this was 10 years ago, and it's doing exactly what we wanted it to do. You, you've talked a lot with us about trees that are being planted mm -hmm. throughout city parks. And as you mentioned, this has been going for 10 years. So we're starting to get some we're size to, on and these And you know, trees. a lot of times when they'll talk about in landscape architecture school, start drawing them that are seven to 10 years old. Well, this you can start seeing seven to 10 years. And, and and they have the labeling on them and fantastic trails that go around so connectivity these are some of those amenities on parks and trails and all and people can take this home to their backyard they can say i really want to see a cedar elm or i want to see a bald cypress and yeah. they can know how large it is and this is seven years old or ten years old so it's a great asset in many many ways and you also have power lines like so many of That's us right. do and and you've learned how to you know, right. mitigate that. Yeah, so on the south end of this park, there were major power lines. So all the trees planted, there were 275 trees that we helped fund here, and the trees in those were what we call our utility trees. They were trees that should mature under, under what the utility lines and not compensate. You're, you know, we have a policy at the Community Foundation, we never are going to plant a tree that we anticipate in any way will interfere with the power line and that's just a good good practice but sometimes you need to kind of lead by example and this was an opportunity we saw well you can see a lot of people are out here using this yeah every morning every day every night and then when you sit there and you say right south of it is oklahoma christian college that has a fantastic trail system that links back to oklahoma city trails and then through the park it goes on to the Edmund Trails, so this is exactly what we're always looking for, that park, that connectivity, maximum benefit to the community. Another green belt that's being Fantastic. established, yes. is Ryan Auctioner, who is the green infrastructure planner for the city of Edmond, and you're responsible for maintaining this park. Can you tell us a little bit about what's gone into this arboretum? That's right. Well, um, in addition to the tree plantings, the hundreds of trees out here, we've also enhanced that uh, user experience by coming out with the tree signage um, and those sorts of things so they can have a visual of what these trees look like. Yeah, the signs are great and they give you a lot of information about that tree as well. I mean, it's nice for a homeowner to be able to come out and see exactly what they might be getting when they buy something at the nursery. We're very fortunate to have that opportunity here. You can read a lot about trees online, but to come out and experience them and see how they actually work here in Oklahoma is a great asset. Yeah, and so the rest of the park though, there's a lot of other assets to this park as well. You've got a fishing pond and the dog park. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about those other features? Sure, we see people here using this park for all sorts of different opportunities from the very popular dog park to the Xeriscape demonstration garden. Uh, further down, we've got a fishing pond. Um, all that's connected back here to the Arboretum through this trail system that we have throughout the park. And of course, we have traditional playgrounds over on the east side of the park. And for those who aren't familiar with Zero Escape, that is drought tolerant gardening. So not only do you get your information about your trees, but you can also find those plants that do well here in Oklahoma. Absolutely. Very uh, Oklahoma focused on what we have to display here. With low water. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, can you, ha you have a kind of an open prairie a little bit between the Arboretum and the other garden. Can you talk a little bit about that? We do. We have an open prairie here that uh, when this was established, it was a lot of pasture land, essentially. And there were some great um, uh, ecosystems of native grass throughout here. And as, that, as this area has been established for other uses, those ecosystems kind of change. So it's been a learning experience on how do we manage those to, to maintain that type of ecosystem that existed here before. Because you'll notice it's different than most parks. I mean, it's not completely mowed. You actually have some areas that are a little more natural, but yet they're highly maintained still. I mean... Absolutely. A lot of maintenance goes into that natural look. <laughs> Definitely. Well, it looks beautiful out here. Thank you. Thank you. Our pleasure. Oklahoma Gardening would like to thank the Oklahoma City Community Foundation for the work that it does throughout Oklahoma and its support of our program. 
Since 1969, the Oklahoma City Community Foundation has worked with donors to create charitable funds and bring together and empower partnerships that benefit our community, both now and into the future. For more information about programs and opportunities for giving, visit the Foundation's website, OCCF.org. I'm Jim Schreffler. I'm the Area Extension Horticulture Specialist uh, for Southeast Oklahoma with the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service. Uh, we're here at the, at the West Watkins Agriculture Research and Extension Center today. Uh, well, what we have here actually at this, at this uh, to look at today is a variety trial that includes uh, a number of different varieties of red onions. Now these are some, some onion varieties that just became available recently on the market. They were newly developed by, by several different companies and, and one by New Mexico State University. Uh, why are we doing a trial with red onions? Well, when it comes with yellow onions, which are probably the most popular type, we have several good varieties available now. We have uh, a short day one, which means they, that they mature earliest, and that would be uh, Texas 1015Y or Texas Super Sweet, different names for the same onion. And we also have one called Candy, which is very popular, and, and it's, it matures a little bit later. It's called an intermediate day length onion. Now our red onions here, these are all supposed to be intermediate day length onions, the ones we have in the trial here. And, uh, and what we're finding now, uh, what we're finding is that some of them uh, tend to be a little bit earlier than others because uh, we'll look at them here in a moment, but uh, as, an onion, as, a, as an onion plant matures, it develops its bulb. And when it gets to the point where that bulb is, bulb is fully matured, the tops will all of a sudden on their own they'll fall over, okay? That's not, you don't have to break them over anything. They just on themselves, by themselves, the neck of the onion becomes weakened and it falls over, so. Sometimes growers uh, get, call us and ask us and, and they say, well, my, uh, my, my onions look real nice, but all of a sudden they made a, a big, long, tall stalk uh, and made some nice, pretty flowers on the head, but they're not growing an onion bulb. So what, what did, I, did I do something wrong? That, uh, that we call that bolting and it's actually the onion going from just a, a, um, a vegetative growth phase to a reproductive phase and producing flowers. And those flowers will, if we leave them there, they'll produce seeds. Now, now the thing that causes that is when that onion plant was small, you know, maybe about the diameter of, of your small finger there, when the plant, onion plant was that small, if it was exposed to temperatures in, uh, in the mid 40s or so for a prolonged period, that's what, that's what uh, triggers the physiology of the onion plant to uh, eventually make that seed stalk. So, uh, so, but if they don't expose, in most of these you see will, don't have the seed stalk, they're not going to get it. They're just going to mature and the tops will fall over. But this does occasionally happen. And, it, and a lot of times uh, gardeners will buy, uh, buy tra onion transplants and plant them and they get a lot of these. So one thing I can say when you buy your transplants, get them as early as possible in, in February and also uh, avoid the ones that have, have, have lots of big onions in, in the, pa in the uh, in, you'll, be, you'll get a pack of about 60. Avoid the ones that have the big fat ones. St stick with the ones that, that are, that are diameter of your finger or smaller and you'll, you'll have uh, less incidence of that problem. So. Today we're here at Southwood Landscape and Garden Center and we're looking at ways to add focal points into the garden. Now typically this guy is our main focal point, <laughs> but he's going to show us some other specimen plants. What do you have for us, Paul? Well, okay, so the whole notion of specimen mm -hmm. is meant to just jump out at you, to draw your eye. It's a focal point. Right. And every landscape deserves at least one. So they don't have to be dramatic, but typically they are. So I wanted to show you some of the more dramatic ones to start. Okay. And easily the most popular is the weeping atlas cedar. Yeah, look at this, it's beautiful. They really are stunning. Uh, some people call them Dr. Seuss trees. Uh, I like that actually. <laughs> um, but holy cow, they just, they scream at you, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, you cannot miss a specimen like this. Right, and each one of them are so unique. They look like art sculptures really, they do. I think. They do. And if you can imagine, if you paired these two arches, you know, you could create- A tunnel? A, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That's a really cool effect. So, and you know, the blue is nice. Right, right. Nice departure from green. 
And it's not, a good tough plant for Oklahoma. Oh yeah. You know, I mean. They love it here. Yeah. They love it here. So what but, else do we have? Well, in a smaller, more shrub-like form. Going green now over here. Going green. This is a Japanese white pine okay. called Fukuzumi. And if you're a real conifer nut, you know that when you see this wooden box, mm -hmm. it comes from Isley Nursery in Boring, Oregon. Uh, I've been there a couple times. Right. It's anything but boring, I assure you. And they're well known for their conifers and they're just, their specimen plants. Yeah, They are premier growers. Yeah. Um, so something like that, you know, again, Hello, yeah. <laughs> look I, at me. I love this. It looks like little, uh, it, almost like it's been pruned, but it hasn't been no. at all. And it's coning. I mean, it's just really, really spectacular. And behind it. What's, yeah, that tall one. That is sometimes called an Alaskan cedar. It's not a cedar at all. It's a, it's a Camacypris mm -hmm. nutcatensis. Okay. Um, the upright forms, typically you've got Jubilee, Green Arrow. There are several different cultivars out there, but that makes a heck of a statement as well. Yeah. And, and it kind of gives you that eerie look a little bit. A little bit. Um, they're well adapted here, good well-drained soil, mm -hmm. which is the case with most conifers. Um, and watch its watering needs a little bit. Not, not too wet, not too dry. Just, just right. Just right. <laughs> it's got that Goldilocks watering requirement. But uh, I, I love those. And they're just upright. Doesn't take up that much room. Well, it looks like you might have a few more on the other side. Let's go around oh, there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Paul, this one will definitely grab your eye in a garden. Yeah, you know, if, if the weeping blue out of the cedar was the Dr. Seuss tree, uh -huh. this is Cousin It, <laughs> uh, for, for those old enough to remember the Adams Family Show. Right. These, this is a Picea abes pendulum. Mm -hmm. um, actually a fairly common plant, but you just don't often see them grown to this height yeah. and oh, spectacular. They're beautiful. Again, the wooden box, uh, so you know it's a quality plant. And uh, we've got two of these, so I've just often thought, you know, there's some large home where these could flank the entrance, or, you know, so dramatic. Yeah, I just love how they look like a, you know, a drapery or a cascade yeah. almost. Yeah, and you'll get a little dieback as they grow in the interior. Just prune it out, it's no big deal. That just makes it more unique, right? Yeah. All right, well, we got another cascading one over here behind us. Yes. And this one looks a little softer. This is Pinus strobus. Uh, Angel Falls, this is called. Mm -hmm. So it's a white pine, and it's just stunning. I love this thing. Really dense growth, beautiful weeping form. And I'll tell you something. It'll weep all the way to the ground, mm -hmm. but then sometimes the needles will get all... Kind of nasty. Yeah, but if you plant this in such a way that you've got rocks oh you know, yeah and, and you can let those lower branches cascade over the rock right and soften the rocks a little bit really pretty very nice really pretty effect these are these are all beautiful they are and we've got one over here that is anything but cascading yes. I mean, it looks like it's been pruned this way this is uh, a style of pruning called the hindu pan uh -huh. and uh, this is another uh, japanese pine but look at that i mean it's just gorgeous. I love the bark on it too. The bark is beautiful, little exfoliation almost. Mm -hmm. um, now, the, with something like this, you do have to maintain, you gotta pinch those candles right. routinely to maintain that, what they call the Hindu pan look. But goodness, we've had several of these and they, they, they fly out of here. Yeah, and the candles, when you're talking about that, is the new growth that, that's coming out and basically you pinch it to keep it, uh, it's pruning it. Exactly, exactly. So, now I should mention, these aren't cheap. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's fifteen hundred dollars but that's a lot of growth you're getting for that i mean that's been growing for a long time so Bingo. that's the the cost really that yes. you're paying for yes and not just grown but manicured and tended to right all along the way very different than any of our other perennials or trees that just grow quickly i mean right. this has been taken care of for a long time right so, Paul, I mean, these are pricey specimens. What would a person do if they couldn't afford one of these or maybe their garden's not suited for something this elaborate? Well, for, you know, I should make clear, they, they don't have to be conifers. They don't mm -hmm. have to be expensive. You could have a beautiful ornamental grass in a bed that is the focal point, that is the specimen in that bed. Yeah. It could be a nice crepe myrtle. It could be anything, a vitex, one of my favorites. Right. So it doesn't have to be a conifer and it doesn't have to be expensive. But speaking of conifers, there is one I have to finish up with. Uh-oh, okay. Because it's like my new favorite plant. All right. Okay. Is it this big? No, that's the best part about it. All right, let's go look. 
All right, check this out, Casey. What do you got? All right, well, this is a Dawn Redwood. It is? It is. Redwoods are giant, tall trees. Well, and believe it or not, this one, at maturity, mm -hmm. say 10 years, mm -hmm. eight feet tall. Seriously. So it has become my favorite plant for so many different reasons. First of all, a small meta sequoia. Right. Um, gorgeous foliage. It's almost creamy colored, mm -hmm. uh, the new spring growth. And then it'll transition to more of that russet color before it is deciduous. Right, right. It's a deciduous it's like color. It's like bald cypress. I mean, exactly. they're, they're mistaken for each other a exactly. lot. But. Um, but, you know, for a small yard, a courtyard, a bed where you just need that specimen. Yeah. To me, this is ideal. Now, we only got five of these, but, um, and that means that one's already spoken <laughs> for. <laughs> I just can't say enough about this. Well, there you go. You've shown us everything from conifers that are large and, and looming to something that's very petite. Yeah. Yeah. Gorgeous. All make great focal points in your garden. Yeah. It's specimen time. Next week, we'll be renovating our keyhole garden, adding a teepee trellis, and planting it with vegetable seeds. Paul James will be back with some bulletproof perennials to help in your garden planting. And Mike Miller of Pond Pro Shop in Shawnee will show us a simple sand hydroponic system. So join us then for more TV you'll grow to love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklahomagarding.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We wish to thank our generous underwriters, TLC Garden Centers, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society. Hope you enjoyed this video. It's part of our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. You can also find even more videos on our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel. And join us on social media for great gardening tips, photos, and discussion.